Amen. Thank you, Jamel. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for leading us today to sing about and anticipate and look forward to the coming of the Lord. That's sort of a theme that ran through a lot of our songs, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, before we jump in, I just would say that there's something that apparently is fascinating about miniatures. Uh, taking something that's, that's big or of a certain size and sort of shrinking it down. Um, when you're giving out candy at, at Halloween, uh, the miniatures are usually a good way to go. They don't cost quite as much as the big ones. When I was a kid, uh, and I was very pleased a couple of years ago to see that it was still there. One of my favorite parts of going to the Alamo is that in the gift shop in the Alamo, there's this, if, if this is going to sound weird, a very big miniature. Uh, but it's the whole Alamo, and, and somebody did a, a scale model of the Alamo and uh, lots and lots of little soldiers uh, attacking the Alamo and it's just kind of fascinating to go around this big glass case and see the way that they had set it all up. Um, I'm, j I'm just sort of fascinated by miniatures and so when I become uh, a retiree, I've warned my wife that I may get into model train sets. I don't have any right now but it just kind of fascinates me to build little villages or whatever. My parents have a miniature dachshund and so it's a, it's a dachshund but it's you know smaller than the regular dachshund but they are hard at work on making it a not miniature dachshund because it is it's, it's getting big. But what we have here in 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2 is a miniature apocalypse and we talked about this uh, kind of at length earlier in this year when we went through the book of Revelation. The book the word Revelation and the word apocalypse are the same word just in two different languages. Revelation is the word in English. Apocalypse is the word in Greek. And so what we have in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we get to our middle part of going through the book of 2 Thessalonians, is a little miniature apocalypse. If the Apostle Paul had written uh, a book like Revelation, it would look something like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the idea, we hear the word apocalypse and we think the end of the world. Now, that's not what the word means. It means revelation, revealing something that was hidden. But it's related to the end of the world, but as I like to call it, the end of the world as we know it. Because there's something else coming in its place. And as we approach the season of Advent, uh, how, how, all right, it's confession time. How many of you already have your Christmas tree up? Okay, that's yeah, just me then, all right. Uh, but to be fair, it wasn't my idea, it was my children's idea. They, they what? <laughs> and there aren't any ornaments on it. So, you know, we're going in stages. After Thanksgiving, we'll put on the ornaments. As we approach the season of Advent, the season of preparation, rem a reminder that Advent is a season about when, in which we remember the first coming of Christ, but also a season in which we anticipate the second coming of Christ. And it's good to be reminded of this. Jesus is coming again in glory. That's not a wild, out-there idea. That's biblical. Jesus said He was going to come again. The New Testament testifies over and over that Christ is coming again in glory. And so when we preach about the coming of Jesus, that's what we need to be focused on, is what does that mean for us? I love preaching and teaching about that because it's hugely important and so easily misunderstood, or so easy to approach in the wrong way. Because when we talk about Jesus coming again, what most of us want is a timeline. This goes all the way back to the disciples. The disciples asked Jesus, when is this going to happen? What will be the signs of your coming in glory? We would like to get a timeline, and this keeps, I think, a lot of uh, scripture book publishers in business. Is because it's very difficult to take all the various places in scripture that talk about uh, the end of the world as we know it, that talk about uh, when God shows up to make all things new. It's very difficult to kind of piece those together and try and make a timeline because that's not really what the Bible is interested in doing. And Jesus said uh, no, <laughs> basically when the disciples asked him for a timeline. He said, no, I'm not going to tell you exactly when. I'm going to tell you what you need to be doing uh, in the time leading up to that. Instead of a timeline, the Bible gives us a theology. Instead of a timeline, the Bible gives us a perspective. It, think about the word revelation. Uh, it gives us a picture of this is the way the world works. We would like to know exactly, we would like to set a time on our calendar in which we can cancel our insurance policy because we won't need it anymore. We would like a time on our calendar when we can say, well, it's time to go on that vacation we were meaning to go on before it's too late. Uh, I got a card in the mail when I was a, a pastor in East Texas that had it all timed out. 
when these various events were going to happen, and one of them uh, was the explosion of the Yellowstone supervolcano. There's a supervolcano underneath Yellowstone National Park. That's what makes all the water hot and the geysers and things. And they had it timed out. It was supposed to happen last year, so they were wrong. Which, by the way, everyone who has ever made a timeline has been wrong. So there's 100% wrongness there. But I thought, when I first got that, I thought, well, I guess I better go to Yellowstone before it blows up. Uh, we would like a timeline so that we can get to the places we want to get to before it's all gone. Instead, the Bible doesn't give us that. Instead, it gives us a way to look at the world, and especially a way to live in it. Whether Jesus returns tomorrow, or whether Jesus returns 2,000 years from now, the theology doesn't change. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world is going to be. And here is the way that you should live so that you are living in the direction of the way that God is moving the world. So let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and then we'll go back and look in a little detail at what Paul says. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Now we requ request you, brothers and sisters, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, the falling away from the faith, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his presence, his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, so as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence, so that they might believe what is false, in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this that He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. I want you to notice, or go back specifically to verses 1 and 2, because this Paul is, is focusing their attention on what he's going to be talking to them about. Verses 1 and 2. We request you, brothers and sisters, with regard to the coming or the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure, literally that you may not be shaken out of your mind or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Here's what Paul doesn't say. He never uses the words, the end of the world. That's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about the coming of Jesus. Literally, the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said to his disciples, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am present with them. And we believe that the Spirit of God mediates to us the presence of Jesus. That Jesus is with us now as we worship. That Jesus is with you everywhere you go. What this is talking about is the uh, unmediated presence of Jesus. Uh, Jesus, the resurrected one, now in glory, seated at the right hand of God, will come again to the earth and claim it officially for his own. He's already Lord of it, but it is living in rebellion. And one day, the one who really is in charge will come and say, <laughs> will come and do away with those who are in rebellion and welcome back uh, into, uh, uh, to his family, to his presence, those who belong to his kingdom. Uh, literally, it's the presence of Jesus. It's the same word that the ancient Romans used when the emperor was going to visit. Uh, the emperor would occasionally leave Rome and visit other cities in the empire. And when the emperor was coming, uh, the word is parousia, uh, the presence of the emperor. 
Uh, you can kind of see this in reverse, and this is going to date you a little bit. Did anybody ever go to an Elvis concert back in the day? <laughs> anybody? Anybody want to testify? Oh, hey, hey, let's see some people. Okay. Uh, Elvis was, was kind of famous for doing a multitude of encores. People were so excited to see Elvis, and he would come back on stage. What did they say so that people knew that they didn't need to wait around for any encores anymore? Elvis has left the building. The presence has departed. You know, it's kind of in reverse. The Elvis is, he's not coming back on stage because he's not in the building anymore. You, you guys can go home. So it's the other idea. It's Jesus is here. He's present with us. That's what Paul is talking about when he's talking about his coming. And when he comes, he says, we will be gathered together to him. I love that idea. It's like uh, Paul, who's been crisscrossing the Mediterranean and going around and planting churches. He anticipates this day when Jesus' presence is with us on earth, that the people that belong to Jesus will be with him. It will be a family reunion. Those who are separated by distance, those who are separated by time, will be gathered together, belonging to him and all united as one. He doesn't talk about the end of the world. He talks about the coming of Jesus, gathering together around him, and the day of the Lord, a term he borrows from the Old Testament, from the Old Testament prophets who anticipated the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, mean, the day of the Lord means when God shows up. When God shows up and does what God is going to do. And when Jesus returns, that's God showing up and doing what God is going to do. So he gives them four things that he wants them to remember about Jesus' coming, us gathering together with him, and when God shows up. Here's what you should expect when Jesus shows up to reign. Number one, don't be tricked. Ahead of time, it's going to be easy to be deceived about it. And Jesus warned his disciples about this too. Don't be deceived. People are going to tell you things about my coming that are not true. Uh, Paul says, first of all, I don't want you to think you missed it. This tells us uh, how new this concept was of, of Christ appearing because apparently some people in the church thought that or heard a rumor that Jesus had come back and they missed it. Uh, there's an old story. I don't know exactly how true this is. But when Billy Graham was first starting out traveling around doing uh, evangelism, that a friend of his was driving uh, for him and they would take turns driving. Uh, and they were trying to get to some place where they were going to do a revival. And they were driving through the night. And the guy, stopped, the guy who was driving stopped at a gas station. Billy Graham had been asleep in the back seat. And uh, he, the guy went in to pay for the gas. Billy Graham woke up, got up, got out of the car, went into the gas station. And somehow they missed each other in the gas station. And the guy got in the car and started driving away. And about an hour later, he looked back and Billy Graham was gone. And he thought, I've missed Jesus' appearing. Uh, Jesus showed up and took Billy Graham and left me. So apparently the church in Thessalonica, was th some of them were thinking the same thing. We heard that Jesus already came back and we missed it. And Paul says, no. And he basically he says, we talked about this. Don't you remember? Uh, you haven't missed it. It's not something you can miss. Don't be shaken. Don't be disturbed. Don't, don't believe people that said, I said something, when you know what I said. Uh, you're not going to miss God's special action in history. Uh, now, you might be deceived. Uh, some people might tell you that God is up to something that you think, I don't know, that doesn't sound like God to me. Uh, don't be deceived about what God is up to in history. And then he starts dropping hints about things that we really wish Paul had been more clear about. He starts talking about a man of lawlessness. Look at verses 3 and 4. Let no one in any way deceive you. It will not come, that is, the coming of Jesus won't happen unless the apostasy, the falling away from the faith, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Now, on the one hand, that's pretty vague. It's a, a, a vague description of a person. There's no name or even a hint of a name. But on the other hand, that's really specific. He takes his seat in the temple of God. What Paul probably has in mind, I, I think on a couple of different levels here. And again, remember that the Bible in general is not so much interested in giving us a timeline as it is in giving us a theology. So what you can expect before the coming of Jesus is that human beings will set themselves in the place of God. And in particular, human beings in places of power will set themselves over other human beings and say, I'm basically God. But this, there are many examples of this in Paul's past. As he looked back at the Old Testament, he could find many examples of this. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt called themselves sons of God. Uh, 
they were gods to the people of Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar set himself up to be worshipped in Babylon as a god. Uh, one of the Greek rulers over Israel in the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament set himself up as God and demanded to be worshipped as a God. Various Caesars called themselves sons of God. And there was the expectation in the Roman Empire that you would pray not only for Caesar but to Caesar uh, as a deity. And there was one in particular, a name that you may be familiar with, a guy named Caligula. Caligula was a piece of work. Uh, maybe the craziest emperor that Rome ever had. And Caligula had a great idea. He was going to, there were a certain group of people that really resisted the idea of worshiping the emperor, and they were the Jewish people. Uh, they, they just wouldn't buy into the idea that their God, who had rescued them from slavery in Egypt, and their God, who had brought them back from exile, had anything to do with Rome and the Roman emperor. And so Caligula said, well, I know how to fix this problem. I'll just put a statue of myself in the Jewish temple. And everybody said, Caligula, that's a terrible idea. And Caligula said, no, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, he was assassinated before he got the chance to do that. Uh, and that probably happened right about the time in which Paul was becoming a Christian. And so Paul, I don't think, has in mind Caligula, but he has in mind something like Caligula. Because stuff like that has happened in the past, happened recently in Paul's time, and will continue to happen in the future. The Emperor Nero traditionally is the emperor that uh, was responsible for Paul's assassination. And Nero had a statue of himself built uh, out of bronze, I think it was about 60 feet tall, had a statue of himself built where he was dressed as the Roman sun god, and there was a globe, yes, they knew the world was round, there was a globe and there was a tiller, uh, not, a wee, not a boat with a wheel, but a tiller that directs the, the boat, and Nero had himself painted as the Roman, or built a statue of as the Roman sun god with his hand on the tiller of the world. That's what Nero thought of himself. This is something that has happened, was happening during Paul's time, will be happening in Paul's future, and is still happening, of human beings setting themselves up in the place of God in the world. Whether they say it or not, they imagine themselves as holding on to the tiller of the world. We are the ones. I am the one that directs the world and the fate of the world. And they are wrong, uh, is Paul's description to them. Uh, this is where it gets tricky, because we'd like a timeline, we'd like to nail down exactly who this is. It gets tricky because there are other passages that talk about figures like this in different terms. So, is this the same person as the person in uh, Revelation that's described as the beast? Is this the same person as the person or persons who are described in 1 John as the Antichrist? Is this the same person or persons who are described in Daniel's visions of God showing up? Is this the same person or person who are described in Jesus' words? And again, I think it's not so much about nailing down the specifics as it is about the theology. They're always going, until Jesus returns, there are going to be people who set themselves up in the place of God. One of them ultimately is going to be the last one. <laughs> but they're still here. Uh, they were there in Paul's day, they're here now, and they will be whenever Jesus returns. There is going to be somebody who has set themselves up in the place of God. Here's a, they're described as, in this passage, as the man of lawlessness. So here's a hint. Anybody that thinks of themselves as above the law is a good candidate for this character. It may not be the character, the one right before Jesus comes back, but it's in the same family. It's in the same line. Anybody that sets themselves up as above the law. But there's good news. And again, sort of vague news, but good news. Look at verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. This is one of those parts where Paul says, remember when I told you this? And us now sitting 2,000 years later going, you didn't tell us? <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? Can you be more specific? The idea here is that there's not, the powers of evil and the powers that set themselves up in the place of ruling the world are not the only powers that work in the world. That God has in place some kind of power that's restraining evil and keeping it from being as evil as it might possibly be. There's power at work to hold back uh, what might be going on. No further detail is given here. And so it's not really much help for us to speculate on what that might be. What it is helpful for us to remember is that there is a spiritual battle going on in which evil is trying to destroy the world and God is trying to preserve and save it. And that there is more than one power at work in the world. And the best news of all comes in verse 8. The lawless one will be revealed and the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. 
The world will not hold two lords. Uh, and neither can the human heart, by the way. But the world will not hold two lords. The world will not hold any person that sets themselves up in the place of God when Christ appears to uh, receive the kingdom that is rightfully His. And those who chose to be blind, those who have chosen uh, to blind themselves to the truth, will continue to be blind to the truth, Paul says. But the good news is that justice will come on the earth. That evil that sets itself up to rule will be done away with when Christ returns. This is not just something that will happen. It's something that did happen in the past, in the Old Testament, in Paul's day, and something that is happening. You can easily find, at all levels, people of lawlessness that have set themselves up above the law. The bad news is that that works for a while. If setting yourself up above the law, uh, it can, it can re reap you some benefits. People wouldn't do it if it didn't work, uh, at least for a time. But the good news is it won't work forever. Jesus will not brook that kind of uh, bucking of his authority <laughs> for all time. Justice will come on the earth. That's part one of Paul's little mini apocalypse. What to expect in a world that doesn't recognize its Lord. Expect men of lawlessness, people of lawlessness, to set themselves up in the place of God. Expect that there are spiritual forces at work that are keeping evil from being as evil as it possibly could be. Uh, expect that people will follow those who set themselves up in the place of lawlessness. But expect that justice is coming. But I like verse 13 because it turns from this picture. Paul has painted a picture of the world. This is what the world is. A place that is in rebellion against the kingdom of Christ. A place that is in rebellion against God. But verse 13 turns to you. But we, but you, now that you know how the world works, now that you know how the world is, how do you live in a world like this? What's your responsibility? Look at verses 13, 14, and 15. We should always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. And it was for this that He called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold on to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, Comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good word and work. How do you live in a world like this? What's our responsibility in a world still anticipating the coming of Christ, of our gathering together? Number one, give thanks. Give thanks for one another and give thanks for your relationship with God. Thank God that we don't depend on knuckleheads who think they are God to save us. That's a precise theological term, knucklehead. Uh, Thank God we don't depend on knuckleheads who think they are God to save us. We have God, actually, <laughs> to save us. Uh, it, it doesn't depend on the powers of the world that think they're in charge. We can depend on God. And in these verses, uh, sometimes Paul does this, just packs a whole bunch of stuff in just a small space. Uh, a beautiful and thorough picture of salvation. Verse 13, he has chosen you from the beginning. He knew you before you were made and knew you would be part of his family of faith. That's what he's always wanted from you. And he chose you before, from the beginning. He sanctified you. Sanctified means made holy. When Paul addresses several of his letters, he addresses them to the saints. Uh, it's a risky thing to think of yourself as a saint, <laughs> but it is a theological truth that God sees you as a holy one. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you've been justified, declared not guilty, not because of what you've done, but because of what Christ has done. Because of your repentance and putting your faith in Him. He counts you with Christ. You've been sanctified, made holy by the Spirit, made holy by faith. You've been called through the gospel, he says. God called you out. The good news came to you. God was calling to you, uh, seeking and, and reaching and, and calling you into uh, His family from which you had left by your sin. He's called you through the gospel and He's called you not only to be sanctified, not only to receive the good news, but to be glorified with Christ. An old way of breaking this down is justified, sanctified, glorified. Justified means declared not guilty. When we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, God has brought the gavel down and said, I am not counting their sins against them. They've put their faith in Jesus. He has paid the price for their sin. And so, although they are guilty, I am not counting them as guilty. 
It's God's mercy and God's grace. Sanctified means that we are made holy. God sees us that way and God is making us that way. The Holy Spirit is at work in our life to make us into the image of Christ. And ultimately, that project will be fulfilled. We will be glorified. Several times in the New Testament it says we will be like Him when He comes. We will be made like Him. Purified. What a relief. Whew. To be able to say, I am what God has always intended me to be. There's no part of me that is marred by sin. I can stand before my brothers and sisters in Christ. I can stand before Christ. I can stand before God Himself without shame because He has made me glorify with Christ. That's good news. Give thanks for what God has done. Give thanks for what God is doing in your life, in your spirit, in His church, in His family. These are group projects, sanctification and glorification. It's not just something that you experience, but something we experience together. So then there comes the command. First of all, thank God for that. Secondly, stand firm and hold on. This, by the way, is the most common thing that the Bible talks about when it talks about Christ's coming. Jesus said, be on the alert. Stay awake. Paul says, stand firm. Revelation says, stay awake. Be on the alert. Pay attention to what God is up to in the world. Pay attention to what God is doing. Stand firm and hold on. N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar who said, when are you most often told to stand firm and hold on? Uh, when there's a rough ride coming. <laughs> when you're on a boat, maybe, and the boat is starting to rock. Hold on. Uh, when you're trying to get into a canoe, it's a good time to hold on. Hold on. Stand firm. When the wind starts blowing really hard, hold on. Uh, when you are entering into a time that you know is going to be difficult, stand firm and hold on is the command. When the ride is going to be rough. And what specifically do we hold on to? Hold on to the tradition. What does Paul have in mind? I think he has in mind uh, the gospel. That's what he keeps reminding them of. Keep in mind what I told you. What God has done in Christ Jesus. Keep in mind what Jesus did on the cross. Keep in mind His resurrection from the dead. Keep in mind that evil and sin and death don't have the last word in this world because God has proved that in what Jesus did. Keep in mind what Christ has commanded us to do and to be. Keep in mind the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hold on to that. Be a part of the story that God has been writing from the beginning. Uh, be a part of the life uh, that God has been bringing into the world. Be a part of that commitment, that uh, community of commitment to God and doing God's will. And then Paul ends with a prayer. May Jesus, may the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. That's a great start <laughs> to a prayer. May Jesus and God who love us and comfort us and have already given us hope May He continue to comfort us and strengthen us in every good word and work. Here's, I think, the way to live. That every bit of revelation in Scripture, that every bit of revelation that talks about this is the way the world is and this is how we live in it, asks us to keep in mind two things. God asks us to do what we can do. And God will do what He can do. And both of those things go together. If it were just one or the other, we'd be in trouble. If we were just sitting around waiting for God to do what He was going to do, we would be unfaithful because He's asked us to do some things. But if we get ourselves convinced that it all depends on us, then what do we need God for? We've replaced God. But God asks us to do what we can do, and He will do what He can do. Richard Foster, who writes about spiritual disciplines, compares it to growing a garden. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do to prepare a garden, to grow a garden, to keep a garden growing. You can prepare the soil. Uh, once you've planted your seed, you can continue to pull weeds. Uh, you can continue to be uh, vigilant, to keep away pests. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do. What you can't do is make the sunshine. What you can't do is make it rain. We do what we can do and God will do what He can do. We prepare the soil, we pull the weeds, we plant the seeds. And God will provide the sunshine and God will provide the rain in season. And God, ultimately, is the one who provides the harvest. You can do everything right. You can put the seeds in the ground and water them. But unless God decides that the seed is going to grow, it's not going to grow. The call on our lives is to ask ourselves, what has God asked me to do? Uh, and this is not a trick question. Look at what Jesus commands his disciples to do, to follow him, uh, to share the gospel, to love your neighbor as yourself. These are not trick questions. 
to be paying attention to the work of the Spirit in your life. What is the Spirit commanding you to do? We do what we can do. And God will do what He can do. Sorry, there's a, you're a little early. The invitation time comes <laughs> soon. But come back and you're in the invitation time. Um, God asks us to do what we can do. And God will do what He can do. That's Really, that's the truth of every revelation. Uh, every bit of revelation asks us to be faithful, to be firm, to hold on. And it promises that God will do what He can do. God will bring justice on the earth. Uh, that's a promise from Scripture. Christ will return. Bet on it. The Bible is not so much interested in giving you a timeline. The Bible is very much interested in making sure that you live believing that that's true and live in a way that you'll be ready when He comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the challenge and the comfort of the revelation of the truth that Christ will come again. Thank You, God, for the comfort of knowing that evil sin and death will not always reign in this world. Thank you, God, for the comfort of knowing, God, that you, in spite of what we've done and, and who we've been on our own, you've chosen us, called us, sanctified us. Heavenly Father, if there are any here today that know that you have been reaching out to them, calling them, asking them to come and be part of your family, asking them to come and be part of your kingdom, but they've been hesitant, they've been resistant, I pray, God, that you would open their hearts, open their minds, open their ears, God, to hear the calling of your spirit, to be part of your kingdom, to be sanctified, to be glorified. Heavenly Father, thank you for the challenge of this word. I pray, God, that it reminds us to be faithful in what you've called us to do. That it reminds us uh, in times that we know it's going to be tough, when the wind is going to blow, when the waves are going to rock, that you would help us to hold on and to stand firm in doing what you've commanded us. Thank you, God, for your promise and what you will do. Help us, God, to do what you've commanded us to do. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.